אנחנו מוצאים את הפורום, זה ראשים שוי. האם זה באמת סגולה בדוקה? הסגולה ללמוד בזה? מה? כן. Tov, good evening everyone. We're in the Zerah Shimshon on Parshas Bolak. We are going to do Os Yud Gimel, section 13. It's the last piece in uh, on the Parsha. And before we begin, we're going to look at a Pasuk. It's not a Pasuk, interestingly enough, from the Parsha itself, but it is a Pasuk that deals with what the, with the, the uh, subject matter of our Parsha. It comes from Sefer Devarim, and Parsha's Kiseitze. And what's happening here is Hashem is talking about those people who cannot convert and join the Jewish people, cannot become members of the Jewish people, or certainly cannot easily become members of the Jewish people. And uh, it talks about the uh, Mo- Moab and Ammon, the nations of Moab and Ammon. And the Torah says that they did a terrible thing when they did not greet the Jewish people and welcome them and let them pass through their land. But instead, they hired Bilam to come curse the Jewish people. So let's take a look at that Pasuk. This is per, a Devarim Perak Chaf Gimel, Pasuk Vav. Vilo Ova Hashem Elokecha Lishmoa El Bilam. And Hashem did not wish to listen to Bilam. Vayahafo Hashem Elokecha Lecho Es Haklola Livracha. And Hashem, your God, turned for you the curse to a blessing. Ki ahevcha Hashem alokecha, because Hashem, your God, loved you. So we see in that Pasuk, which the Zerah Shimshon is going to start with in a moment, we see in that Pasuk that, that uh, Hashem uh, turned Abilam's curses into blessings. And let's now move into the peace. Again, Parshas Bolak Os Yud Gimel, Pasuk, the Pasuk says, Vayahafoch v'chule, and Hashem turned or changed, transformed as haklala livracha, the curse to a blessing. That, of course, is the Pasuk we just read. Makshim ha-meforshim, the commentators ask a question. De'ech yitochen lomar, how is it possible to say that the curse itself became a blessing. Even though we can say that blessings came to the Jewish people that were similar to the things that Bilam wanted to curse the Jewish people, Mikol Mokom, nevertheless, ein haklolo atzmo lebracha, the curse itself didn't become a blessing. That's question number one, right? The Zer Shimshon is saying that the commentators ask, why does this Pusik and Sefer Devarim and Parshas Kiseite that we just looked at say that God changed the curse to a blessing when actually it would seem that that's not quite accurate. It would seem that it's more accurate to say that God blessed the Jewish people in similar ways to the, to the, uh, to the things that Bilam had originally wished to curse them about. So if Bilam wanted to curse them and intended originally to curse them in a certain way, God made Bilam say blessings. God compelled Bilam to say brachos, along the lines, on similar lines and in similar ways to the things that Bilam, in the areas that Bilam wished to curse the Jewish people. However, this Pasuk doesn't really say that. This Pasuk says, God turned the curse itself into a blessing, and the Zerah Shimshon uh, says the commentators are a little uncomfortable with that. Is that actually what happened? Was a curse really directly changed into a blessing? That's question one. The ode in another question, Mahu Tevas Lecha. What does the word to, to you or for you, the word Lecha, what exactly does it mean in this Pusuk? Uh, the Pusuk stated that Hashem turned the curse uh, into a blessing for you. Obviously, it's understood that Hashem did this for the Jewish people. That's what the Pusik is saying, and that's what the Pusik is talking about. And that's because Hashem loved the Jewish people. So it's clear that Hashem did this changing of the curse to a blessing. 
for the Jewish people. So why did the Pusik have to say lecha for you? That seems like a, uh, a an example of a redundant and unnecessary word. That's question two. So the Zer Shimshon chooses to answer the second question first. Here comes in the next paragraph the answer to the uh, second question. Ulanios dati, and the Zer Shimshon says, according to the poorness of my thought, Nira, it would appear, de tevas lecha itzterich, that the word lecha to you or for you is not redundant, it is needed, it is necessary. De salka datach lomar, because you might have thought to say, shehoil she bilam bireches Yisrael, since bilam uttered blessings for the Jewish people, for B'nai Yisrael, you might think that Bilam also would be blessed as a result of the fact that he uh, articulated blessings for the Jewish people. Kidichsiv, as a Pasuk says, and this Pasuk is from the uh, incident, the episode where Yitzchak Avinu at the end of his life, towards the end of his life, uh, called in Esav to give him a bracha, but of course Yaakov Avinu, with the help of his mother, came in with the help of Rivka, and Yitzchak Avinu blessed Yaakov Avinu. So uh, in that blessing, it says, uh, baruch. the ones who bless you will be blessed. So therefore, the Zerah Shimshon says, if people who bless uh, B'nai Yisrael, Klai Yisrael, who blessed the Jewish people, end up getting blessed. Well, Bilam blessed the Jewish people, so therefore you might logically assume that Bilam would be blessed. Kamash Molon Kra, so the Pasa comes to teach us Lecha, it puts in this extra word for you. Didafka Legabe di Yisrael Hayu Habrachos, that the blessings were specifically. Uh, specifically benefited uh, B'nai Yisrael, Klal Yisrael, Velo Legabe de Bilam, and they did not have any relevance. They did not bring any blessings to Bilam. So we learn that from the word Lecha. It has a very uh, specific meaning and, and, and need to be there. Otherwise, we might think Bilam would have been blessed because he blessed Klal Yisrael, B'nai Yisrael. Let's continue. Now the Zer Shimshon is going to move to his first question. He's going to begin to develop his answer to the original first question. Regarding the transformation of the curse to a blessing. We need to analyze She'im Novin Hadovar Kipshuto. If we understand this matter according to its simple way of understanding it, that Bilam in his thinking was cursing B'nai Yisrael, and in his mouth he was articulating a blessing, right? So the Zer Shimshon says, what actually happened in the story in our parsha of Parshas Bolak? What, what physically, what actually transpired? So he says, well, the simple way to understand it is that Bilam very much wanted to curse the Jewish people. That was his passionate desire. However, Hashem compelled him to bless the Jewish people. And so in his mind, Bilam was thinking of curses, but his mouth was uttering Blessings. If that's how we understand the story, then pshita, then it should be obvious, she'ain kan klala klal, that there was no cursing that actually took effect whatsoever. De bechol ha Torah kula, because in the entire Torah, we have a rule which is devarim shebelev lo havu devarim klal. Matters which are in the heart, things, things that a person thinks about at a time when the person is articulating other things, the things in the heart, the things the person's thinking don't uh, matter at all. Let me give you an example. Let's imagine you and I are doing a business transaction. 
and you want to buy my car. And I say to you, that's fine. I'll sell you my car for $1,000. It's an old clunker and I'll sell it to you for $1,000, right? And you agree and we shake on it. And now afterwards, I say to you, ha, boy, did I get you. You owe me $5,000. $5,000, why would I owe you $5,000? Well, when I said I'd sell it to you for a thousand and I shook your hand and we made a deal, I was thinking in my mind that I was going to do the transaction for 5,000, not a thousand. I said a thousand, but in my mind, I was thinking 5,000. So you got to give me $5,000. Well, fortunately, the halacha doesn't work that way. And it's irrelevant what I was thinking in my mind, what I say, what I articulate is what's important, not what I'm thinking in my mind. And this is, a, and the Zer Shimshon says, this is a general uh, rule. And because that's a general rule, we have a we have a problem. Here is the problem. Let me let me uh, uh, put the problem out there because the Zara Shimson assumes we understand it without spelling it out. Our problem is that there should be no need for Hashem to change any klolos, any curses that Bilam was thinking about in his heart and his mind into blessings, he doesn't need to do that. He doesn't need to, to do anything with the curses. Why? Because Bilam articulated blessings. And we hold whatever he might have been thinking in his heart or in his mind at the time he was blessing B'nai Yisrael is irrelevant. Lo havu devarim. Those things are not to be taken into account at all. They, they don't, it's as if they don't exist. We don't care about the curses that Bilam was thinking about. All we care about is the blessings that he said. So that is a little bit of a problem for us because the Torah in the Pasuk we started with in Sefer Devarim specifically says God uh, changed the curse to a blessing. So the Zerah Shimshon says, no, nah, no need for that. The curses shouldn't have had any effect or any possibility of taking effect. So why would God need to change them to a bracha, to a blessing. That's the understood question here. De'afilu hecha de'amrinon nodrin la'anosim bepera gimel nididarim. Because even in the case where we say, it's actually a series of cases, even in the cases in, in Meseches nidarim, in the third parak, where we say that a person can take a vow to someone who either might kill the person or might steal the person's belongings uh, or, or might claim them all as a tax duty. In all of those cases, the victim, the potential victim can take a vow, a verbal vow, as long as, and at the same time have in his mind that he's not really intending to take that vow, and we'll explain in a moment, and the Gemara says that works. So, and that's a case where what's in the person's mind does take effect, does have significance according to the halacha. So let me explain so you understand what the Zer Shimshon is talking about. The Gemara over there gives an example that a, a bandit, uh, a robber or a bandit, uh, comes and sees a person uh, traveling, let's say, with a, a, a wagon full of produce. And the bandit makes it clear that he wants the produce. So the person can say, uh, can say, I, this produce is all truma or, and has to go to a Kohen. It's not mine. It's, it's been designated as truma to go to a Kohen. Or this person can say, all of this has been designated to go to the base Hamelech, to the house of the king, and I'm just the messenger to bring it. So obviously you can't take it because then the king's soldiers and servants are going to come after you. So, of course, if I had my own produce, you could take it. But, but, uh, but this is the king's produce, or this is produce that's been designated as truma to go to a Kohen, and you don't want to mess with that. You don't want to take the Kohen's truma. So if the, if the robber accepts that, no problem. But what if the robber says, no, nah, I don't know. That sounds like a, a made up story. That sounds kind of contrived. So the Gemara says the person is allowed, is permitted to say 
if this what I'm telling you is not true, then I then he is taking a vow that all of the produce, not just here, but all of the produce in the world is forbidden to him. He can take such a vow, even though, of course, he has no intention of forbidding all the produce in the world to himself. And he's just saying that in order to get the convince the bandit, uh, the robber to leave him alone. He can do that. But at the same time, when he's saying those words, he should be thinking in his head, of course, I don't mean that. I'm not, I don't mean this vow that all the produce in the world should be forbidden to me. And in that case, the Gemara suggests that what the person thinks in his mind has validity and protects him from the words that he articulated about forbidding all the produce in the world for him to eat uh, any of the produce in the world. So that seems to be a case where what a person thinks, even though it's in contradistinction to what he says, can have effect. So the Zer Shimshon says, even though the Gemara Nidarim says that, he says, let's take a look, not just at the Gemara, but how, it's, how the, the halacha is brought down in Shulchan Aruch. And in specifically now he's quoting from a comment by the Ramah, Rav Moshe Isserlis, in the Haggah comment on uh, Rav Yosef Cairo's text of the Shulchan Aruch. And it says, Ubilvad shelo yotzi mipiv. This is true, that the thoughts that he's thinking can take effect as long as he doesn't say words, dovar shehu beferush neged masha belibo something which is clearly different than what he's thinking in his heart. So the Zerah Shimshon says, okay, we've got the Gemara Nidorim that might seem to present a problem because it does say we have to sometimes take into effect what a person's thinking, but that's not really go, that doesn't really go against the principle that, that, uh, that the Zerah Shimshon has established that we don't have to take into account what a person is thinking. Because over there it says the only time the words take effect is if what the person is thinking isn't completely contradicting what the person is saying. Okay, um, so, uh, the the low. Let's continue into the top of the next column. The low shari in such a thing where a person um, thinks something different than what they're apparently uh, make, taking a vow about is not shari, is not permissible. Unless in his heart he thinks, today I'll forbid myself, my vow will take effect on all of the produce in the world, meaning I can't eat any fruits or vegetables uh, from the rest of today, but I'm not uh, going to be forbidden, the produce won't be forbidden to me on future days, meaning that what the person thinks has to align in some way, even a little way with the words that he's saying. There can't be an absolute black and white, complete contradiction between what the person is saying and what the person is thinking. So as long as in the case of the bandit and the, and the, and the wagon full of vegetables, as long as the person says, Please believe me, Mr. Bandit and Mr. Robber, that this produce doesn't even belong to me and, and you shouldn't mess with it. It's, I'm taking it to the king. And in order to prove to you that it's true, I'm going to forbid on, on he's going to forbid on himself all of the produce in the world. At that moment, he needs to be thinking, yes, I will forbid on myself all the produce in the world for one day. And after that, of course, it'll all be permissible to me. Then his words take effect and, and protect him from actually being forbidden to eat any produce for the rest of his life from all of the fruits and vegetables in the world. Okay, so the Zerah Shimshon says, um, or the person can think something similar, which makes the, the thoughts that he's having align at least a little bit with what he says. Ubepiv Omer, and with his mouth, what does he say? Ye asru kol peiro alov im eno kach. All of the produce in the world is forbidden to him if what he's saying is not true and is not accurate. Now, what he's saying is not accurate. It is not true that he's bringing the produce to the king or he's Truman, he's bringing it to a coin. It is, in fact, his produce. However, he takes this false vow uh, and he's protected from the consequences of his false vow because of the thoughts that he had, which were in part aligned with what he said. 
Kemosha Kosov Shom Hashach, as the Siv Se Kohen commentary in the Shulchan Aruch states over there in Yoridea, the Ayin Shom, and uh, look there for more information. So the Zera Shimshon, let's just try and go back, make sure we, we haven't lost his uh, train of thought. The Zera Shimshon posed a problem, which is Hashem should not need to change the curse of Bilam, the mental curse of Bilam, into a blessing when we don't care what people think in their mind as long as they say the right thing. Bilam uttered an articulated blessing, so we shouldn't have to care about the curses that he said, and Hashem shouldn't need to change them into blessings. So the Zerah Shimshon says, now in case you are a, a, a Torah scholar and you want to bring up the Gemara and Nidorim, which brings in a case where we do take into account what's in a person's mind, you need to realize that that is only true if the what's in the person's mind is somewhat aligned with what they stated. If it's in complete contradiction to what they stated, then again, we don't have to care about what they said. So now the Zerah Shimshon is going to circle back and apply this to our case of Bilam. Second paragraph in the second column. The Hachinami, and here also regarding Bilam. Ach, our Shera Bilam, Shehoyu Muchrach Levarech Es Yisrael Bal Korcho. After Bilam perceived that he was going to be forced by Hashem to bless B'nai Yisrael against his will, once Bilam realized that, uh, that the jig is up and Hashem was never going to allow him to curse B'nai Yisrael, and he was going to have to bless them no matter what uh, he had uh, told Balak and no matter what uh, Balak had told Bilam to do, and what he hired him to do, it didn't matter. Bilam realized that he's going to have to bless B'nai Yisrael. Dima din ze le din haniz kar le'el. Bilam, the Zerah Shimshon says, compared his situation to the case uh, of the Gemara that we just talked about. Dinodrim la'anosim, that a, that a person can take a false vow and it won't have effect when he's up against people who are forcing him or trying to force him to give up his produce or possibly kill him or take his produce by force, the hule, et cetera. Bilam compared his situation to that situation. The choshav belibo, and he thought in his heart, she'osan habrocho shemotzi mipiv, that the blessing that he, the blessings that he was uh, uh, uttering from his mouth lo yiskaimu ela yom echad bilvad, they shouldn't be fulfilled except for one day. The acher kach yihiu klolos, and afterwards they should be curses. So the Zer Shimshon says Bilam, who was not a fool by any means, Bilam had a, a, a thought process here that we need to understand, and his thought process was. Okay, I want to curse the Jews, and I'm thinking of all these terrible curses, but I'm going to have to say blessings. So what am I going to do? How am I going to get my curses to take effect in a roundabout manner? I'm going to do it by, by when I say the blessings, I'm going to think to myself, okay, blessings, I, you're going to actually take effect. Blessings that I'm saying, you're going to take effect, but only for one day. The curses that I'm thinking, they're going to be delayed for one day while the blessings take effect. And then they're going to come back in full force and take effect. And Bill, I'm assumed, based on his knowledge of the uh, reasoning in the Torah Shabbat Peh that we see in the Gemara and Nidarim, and Bill, I'm assumed that that would allow his curses to take effect on Klal Yisrael, God forbid, after one day of his blessings taking effect. Oh, let, let's make sure we understand that, if that were true, would answer the Zer Shimshon's original question, because in that case, if the curses would take effect in those circumstances, then Hashem would need to transform the curses into blessings, which is exactly what the Pusik and Devarim states. and Hasam Bishas. And the Gemara over there in Nidorim that the Zer Shimshon brought down a few moments ago establishes the case that it's only if you're dealing with a tax collector, as we mentioned, the Gemara over there gives three cases, three examples. One is a guy who might kill you if you don't give him the produce. 
One is a guy who's a robber, doesn't generally kill people, but he might take your produce by force. And the third is a tax collector who comes to take your produce. So the Gemara says the only time you can play games with the vow and in, in the ways that we talked about before, where you're thinking one thing and you're saying something different, but you're aligning your thoughts a little bit with your words, that only works when the tax collector is trying to take your produce illegally, unlawfully. He's not actually authorized to take your produce. As Amrinon, then we say, Devarim Shebelev Havu Devarim. The things that the victim in that case is thinking in his heart to protect himself from losing his produce take effect. And, and uh, he can swear falsely and not have any problem, not have any negative consequences because of his false ned there, his false vow. Aval, however, im hum notel meches haroi bedina de malchusa, if the tax collector is a fully authorized by the government, a legitimate bona fide tax collector, and he only wants to take the produce because it, he is he is uh, authorized to do so legally, as as then lo shari lidor bepe. It is not permissible to take a vow. Um, uh, to articulate a vow with one's mouth, the lachshov belibo hayom, and to think in his heart, I only want this vow to take effect today, kiniz el, as we mentioned before, that stratagem, that trick doesn't work if the person taking the produce is doing it lawfully. Lefi, because she'en lo le'odem lehavriya hamecha shel hamalchus, because a person should not run away from the legal tax collecting of the government. Kemosha Pirush Rashi Sham, as Rashi explains on that Gemara in Nidara. <coughs> so the Zerah Shimshon adds a wrinkle to what's going on. And he says, if we go back and look at the Gemara Nidarim, the Gemara uh, wants to make sure that we understand that um, if the person coming to take the man's produce is an authorized, a tax collector, and he's allowed to take the amount of produce that he wants to take. Perhaps he says, I'm here to take 10% of your produce, or because of all your other produce, I'm authorized to take 50%, whatever percent he makes, if it's true and if it's legitimate, and he's legally authorized to take what he's saying he, he wants to take from the man's produce, then it's not permissible and it's not allowed for the man to do the trick of thinking one thing, but aligning it with another thing. That that's, doesn't work. The Hachinami next paragraph, and here also regarding Bilam, this too applies. This is relevant. He wanted to think in his heart something that was unlawful, that was illegal. It went against the law. Because he wanted to curse B'nai Yisrael. Vikvar Omar Lo Hakodish Barhu, and Hashem had already said to him, Lo Soar Esa Om Ki Barahu. You will not curse the nation because it is blessed. So Hashem had made it clear that it was forbidden. It was against the law, so to speak, for Bilam to curse B'nai Yisrael. But Bilam nonetheless wanted to curse B'nai Yisrael unlawfully and an illegal and, and, and against the will of the Ratzon of Hashem, against the will of Hashem. Ubozen, in this situation, ein omrim devarim shebelev havu devarim. In such a situation, what a person thinks in, in his heart has no relevance. It doesn't matter. And the fact that Bilam was thinking in his heart, I might be saying blessings, but I'm only doing it because God's forcing me to. I'm doing it under compulsion. I'm doing it against my will. And therefore, Bilam thought the blessings that I'm articulating should not take any effect. Adaraba, just the opposite. Nefa, nefa, hadover, sheniskaimu habrochos. Hashem turned things around, transformed the whole situation, and turned any of the evil, malicious curses that Bilam was thinking about. He made sure that they all resulted in blessings. Kid the Amrinon bemedrish, as we say in a medrash. This is medrash Rabba on Devarim, an amazing statement. Here it comes. 
al posuk v'shomar Hashem elokecha lecha. The pasuk uh, that the Medrash brings down is a pasuk that says God will guard for you the the uh, the, the blessing and the kindness. Amar Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachman, what does it mean when it says God will guard for you uh, and keep for you the kindness that He planned for you? Call Masha Yisrael Ochlim Baola Mazeh. All of the things that Klal Yisrael Bnei Yisrael eat in this world, meaning all of the benefits uh, that Bnei Yisrael get in this world, Eino Ela Mikoach Habrachos. They only come from the blessing Shebercham Bilam HaRasha, that the wicked Bilam gave them. Aval Ma Shebercham Osam HaOvos, but the blessings that the patriarchs Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov uh, articulated for the Jewish people, Mishumaros, they are guarded and protected. Hain Leosid Lovo for the future, for the world to come. Ad Khan Lashono, until here is a quote. So the Zehar Shimshon says, we see in that Medrash that the, that the blessings that Bilam gave should never be underestimated, should never be taken for granted, because according to the Medrash, those blessings that Bilam HaRasha articulated and said have, have kept the Jewish people eating and drinking and have kept us enjoying life all, for all of the years since he, since he said those blessings begrudgingly, that's what worked. And if we think it's the blessings from the Avos that are, that are, that are giving us uh, a good life, the, the Medrash says, no, those blessings are being held for a future, for a later time. El but now the Zer Shimshon says, we've got one more problem to think about, to resolve. She'im hein brachos mamish, if the blessings that Bilam gave are real, actual blessings, and, and, and they took effect and have, have benefited the Jewish people till today from the time of Bilam, how is it possible, how could it, is it conceivable to say that the blessings that Bilam gave returned to be curses? And the Zer Shimshon is going to quote a Gemara now in Sanhedrin that says that. The Amrin and Beperk Yudal of this Sanhedrin, as we say, in the 11th and final chapter of Mesechesh Sanhedrin, Shekulon Chazru Leklola, all of the blessings that Bilam gave turn into curses at some point. Chutzmi Bate Kinesios Vechule, except the blessings that Bilam gave regarding the Jewish people having synagogues and bate midrashos and study halls. That never ceased. The blessing that Bilam gave, matovu ohalecha Yisrael umishkin osecha Yaakov, right? The blessings that Chazal teaches referred to the Jewish people having uh, places to dive in bate kinesios and places to learn bate midrashos, that blessing took effect eternally forever. That's always applied to the Jewish people. However, uh, this uh, of this opinion, this mandamer in the Gemara in Sanhedrin says that's the only one. All of the other blessings, ultimately at different times in the future, became curses. Shenira mize, it would seem from this, shahoyubahen ksas svara liyos klolos, that there must be some reason, some reasoning why, even though we hold that the things that Bilam thought should not have had any relevance, should not, should not have taken effect at all. Apparently, the fact that he was thinking about curses did ultimately take effect in some way, not at that time, perhaps, but in the future. And that brings us back to our original question, things that Bilam thought, or any person, in things that any person thinks, if they are in complete contradiction to the words that the person is saying at the time that he's thinking the thoughts have no effect. So how can we possibly say that the curses uh, that Bilam was thinking about at the time that he was stating the blessings had some effect later on? How can the Gemara Sanhedrin suggest that? Continuing, Ubame, last paragraph. Ubame Omru Amarnu, and that which we have stated, with that which we have stated, the Zer Shimshon says, the ideas that we've established in this piece, Asi Shapir, everything's going to work out okay. Shebolak Bilam Niskavnu Liros Hamakomos, because Bolak and Bilam had a very specific intent. 
and they went to see places, or they envisioned places, that the Bnei Yisrael in the future would do things to anger Hashem. And on those places, some Chuhaklolos, they rely that the curses could take effect or should take effect because of these things in the future that Klai Yisrael was going to do in, the, in these specific places. The Oz Yisrael, how you ruuyim chas visholem leklala. And in fact, it's true that in those places in, in, the, in the future times when, when Klai Yisrael did anger Hashem through their actions, then, God forbid, but then it's true, it's accurate they, that they were fitting to be cursed because of their actions, their sinful actions. And when Bilam was compelled by Hashem to curse B'nai Yisrael, Hoyu lonu lomar, did devorim she believe, Hoyu devorim. Per, then we needed to realize that the things that were in his heart, these curses that were in his heart, could take effect. And the blessings that he was compelled to say shouldn't have taken effect at all. Why? Because, in fact, the Jews were in the future going to sin grievously in certain situations, in certain places, and, and those times the curses would be applicable. Because Bilam's intention was not to bless them, except for that day. And Bilam's intention, as the Zer Shimshon has already explained, was that they'd be blessed for one day, but cursed for all other days. And Hashem, in His mercy and in His compassion, Hashem took these curses that Bilam had in mind to always apply to the Bnei Yisrael after that first day. He changed them into blessings. According to the practice of Hashem, that God doesn't punish, punish the Jewish people uh, because of ha'averos she'asidin lasos, future sins that they're going to commit. Hashem doesn't look into the future that he knows, obviously, with perfect accuracy, and say, I see they're going to do this sin or that sin, and therefore I'll punish them now. Hashem in his mercy doesn't do that. Uh, and therefore, Hashem did not punish B'nai Yisrael through the curses of Bilam at that time, when Bilam wanted the curses to take effect, Omnum, however, Hazman Atzmo, when certain times came in Jewish history, Shelo, at, at, actually in the future from the time of Bilam, when the Jews did not act appropriately, Hazru Haklolos Kiraoi, then the curses that Bilam uttered actually did take effect, and the Jewish people suffered at different times. Uh, based on the curses of Bilam. Uh, but when the when B'nai Yisrael acted appropriately and fittingly, Hashem gave them the full blessings, Hefech Machshovas Bilam, in a complete opposite way than the intention that Bilam had, which is that the curses should take effect forever. Actually, the blessings took effect forever, except for those moments and those times in specific circumstances and situations when the Jewish people uh, tragically acted in such a way that the curses could take effect. Uh, very, very uh, fascinating piece in the Zerah Shimshon, who's explained several different Gemaras and also ultimately the Pusik and Devarim that he started with so that we understand what was going on with Bilam and the curses and the blessings and how Hashem uh, protected uh, Klal Yisrael then and in all future times. Yashukoch to everyone for joining us this week. We look forward to learning the Zerah Shimshon again, God willing, next week.